Okay. Take two? Yeah. <laughs> part two. Part, part two. two. Okay. Well, we talked about the intake valve. The intake only comes in when your piston comes down. It actually sucks. When the valve is open, it pulls the air into the chamber. As the piston starts changing direction, the intake valve now closes. It comes up. It fires. When it fires, the exhaust valve, when it starts coming down, when it gets to a certain point, the valve starts to open, and it's under high pressure. So it pushes out the exhaust. You say, well, then that doesn't make any difference to me. Well, yes, it does, because if all your induction is coming out and it hits this, it's like hitting a brick wall. It has no place to go. Well, I'm going to put headers on my car. Okay. Then you hook it up to the stock exhaust. Now your stock exhaust is this big, where it really needs to be this big. So you shoot yourself in the foot unless when you start, you go from the top to the bottom, you got to do the whole program, which is what John is doing. Now, that was just a quick term on that. Now, when you get to the cylinder heads, you have to have a camshaft to match the induction system for the amount of fuel and air you're getting into it, which has been done, and we're not going to get into cam overlaps and lift and all that type of thing. Uh, you got that phone okay? Yeah. Um, then we're going to get into, or we're, we're into the cylinder heads as far as the breathing. In this particular case, with a turbo, which is over there, uh, it's a force induction. They say, well, you don't really have to touch anything. You throw a turbo on it, it'll blow it past it. Well, yes, it will. But will it do it at 100% efficiency? Absolutely, absolutely not. It's, it's not possible. So what you do is you take the intake manifold and you, well, first off, you do your heads. You do all your port. You open up your exhaust ports so that it, even though it's being forced out, it needs more room to get more out because you're going to be putting a whole lot more in on the top. Intake has to be done the same way. Now, talking to John before, we were talking about the intake manifold. The intake, the intake manifold to deliver the air, and you're only delivering air. You've got to remember that when you're running a turbo with injectors, because the injectors are directly firing right at the valve. So most carburetor engines is a 14 to 1 air to fuel ratio, which means all the air that you're pulling in off the bottom of the carburetor is taking up airspace. It's fuel. John's case here, with injection, it's not. It's very efficient. It's directly injected right at the valve. So you're just trying to flow air. Well then, why do I have to do anything with the intake? John was told that you could just put the intake on, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. Well, that's not good enough. Uh, you guys can't see this on the camera probably, but all the ports are matched all the way down through to the cylinder head and a tapered. So that when the air is pushed in, it doesn't hit an edge or a corner and change deflection, get deflection or stalling the air. So the, the, the term we want to use there is you ported the intake for me. The intake was ported to match the port job on the heads. So you spend all the money porting the heads, and then you throw this beautiful brand new Ella Brock or whoever's brand that you happen to like, intake manifold on top of your car, and you say, oh, that's wonderful. Well, that doesn't work out so well. Because what ends up happening, see if I got a couple of gaskets here I can give you a, give you a good example to. Let's see, yeah, here we go. This type of thing will happen. Let's call, Let's call, well, let's see, that's going to be hard to see, though. We'll call this your cylinder heads, and we'll call this your intake. If it comes in and it's hitting like that, what good is that doing you? You know, it's actually stalling the air, causing what they call reversion, going like this. Now the turbo has to work harder to try to get it past it. So your object is, is if you've got an oval port design or a square port design or whatever, when you go from, this is an intake gasket. Uh, obviously a little bit larger than what John's got, but that would go to heads like this. So what you're trying to do, we'll turn this head to give you a better example. Hopefully nobody's getting too bored with all of this. You want to cut a gasket to match so it matches these heads. Now when the intake goes on, and the intake is like this, for, for instance, okay? You must take and open this up and either epoxy, if you, you'll never see this, you'll always see that it's like this all the way around. It's too small. But if you happen to see something like this, it's important that either the head is opened up further or the intake manifold is either epoxy or they're aluminum usually. You TIG weld it back up, then you re port them. So what you're looking for is as is, is perfect of a match as you could possibly get. That's what you're looking for. So essentially, well, I'm not going to get, we'll get into it way too deep okay. if I get out of a crazy intake manifold. So, 
Now I've covered that, so basically what's happening is you've got air going down like this. It's just going down in just like this. And it's coming around the exhaust the same exact way. Everything's nice and smooth. Now we're going to get involved with the valves. The valves from the factory are a little small. So what you do there is, is now you take your pockets and your valves here, which is extremely easy to do with the right equipment. You take and you open, the, what these are called bowls. You open the bowls up as far as you possibly can to get to the diameter of the valve. Because if you look at any cylinder head when you stick an exhaust valve in, the exhaust ports are only about that big. The valve is this big. So there's a problem. So what you do is you take this and you cut all this stuff out. So now it is only thousandths shy of the size of the valve. The same with the intake. You do the same thing. Is there, now, is, is there a technical name for that? Is it valve porting or? Uh... Well, it's all part of well, it's all a part of porting the heads. Okay. You know, by bull porting the pockets of the intake and the exhaust valves. Now, obviously, you have to have this a little bit smaller than the valve, because these are two inch, four seventy valves. These are huge. Uh, you have to bevel your edges. You know, it's it's a it's a complex curve all the way around, because when when the air is trying to get past the valve, when the valve is open, it doesn't open like this. It only opens like this. So it has, still has to come around it. That's where it comes into the effect of the piston. Now in John's particular cases, he's like nine and a quarter to one, and it has valve pockets cut into the pistons. Right, nine and a quarter to one, that's a compression ratio? Or? Yeah, I believe it was nine and a quarter to nine and a half, but I'm being, being nice. Okay. They have what they call valve pockets. Now John's is a flat top piston. These are called valve pockets. So what you do, which this was not done correctly, you have to roll the intake pocket over. And the reason for that is when the valve is open, if you're building a high-performance engine, there isn't a lot of what they call valve-to-piston clearance. So when it's open, when the piston is up, you know, when it's getting it, the, the intake valve chases it down. That's the way that works when the intake's coming in. The intake valve chases it down. The piston chases the exhaust valve closed. Well, the intake valve actually chases the piston down. The piston, or the valve, is already in the pocket. So if you don't fold the edge back, Where's the air going to go? It can only escape from here to here. You got a dead spot against your cylinder wall. Now this is all dead right here. So you do with it, you roll back the piston and then you can get better, better flow. Now, like everybody says, well, with a turbo, who cares? It's going to cram it right past it. Well, yeah, that's fine. But you're sacrificing horsepower. You're sacrificing a motor that just isn't as happy as it could be. So we'll move on from there. Let's see, now, now we've got a little bit larger valves in it. Uh, obviously everything's ported, bowl matched. The bowls are all ported out. Then you get into rockers. John found this nice set of rockers. The problem with it, this is a hydraulic roller. See how it still moves right now? It moves because the lifters, these are hydraulic roller lifters. These lift, lifters have not been pumped up yet. As soon as you go, as soon as you make oil pressure, they're gonna lock right up. So what, now what you're into is push rods. So what you've got to do is, because you've decked the block, You've skimmed the heads, you've done whatever, and you got the proper compression ratio. Because you can't always get the piston the height you want it, so you gotta make the block match it. So now that this is all done, now you gotta now you gotta determine your push rod length. You can't just call up and order a set of push rods for this engine, because that's not going to work. So what you have to do is, these are push rods that I use. These are what they call adjustable push rods. So I mean we're getting kind of detailed on how to build an engine. But we do this at all. I have all different length ones, whatever I need. These are just a simply 5 16ths. You don't use a heavy spring. You use a very light spring or it can open with my thumb. And you put this in and you put it on the bottom side of the key. Okay? Now, when it's at zero, lash. Zero lash. And it can't be because a hydraulic lifter has to be crushed to a roughly at least 50 thousandths. 50 to 80 thousandths. So then what I'll do is, is I'll put a dial indicator on the snout and I will turn this longer and longer and longer until I get what I'm looking for. Then I take a set of verniers and I measure it, no matter how long the push rod is. And then I call up and I have them custom made. I always use, well, I shouldn't say always. Uh, even on a stock application, I use 80,000 small push rods. Uh, everybody, I'm sure, has heard of a buddy that's wrinkled a push rod, don't know why, and whatever happened. The problem with the push rod, if you take this push rod right here, a standard 5 16 and you put a lot of pressure at high RPM, in slow motion, this thing looks like an S. That's just the way it is. They look like an S. 
So you go to thicker wall push rods, smaller ID center hole in it, and your problems are solved. We could really get into push rod technology as far as too much oil going on top, how do I restrict it? I, I don't want to run block restrictors in my engine because I want my lifters to get more oil. I'll get into it for a second. We'll take these push rods, always have holes in the end of them. They feed up through the oil. But what they do is you can buy them. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 holes. Now what that does is it replaces the block restrictors that stops the oil from going to the top of the engine. So the oil pressure's up, yeah, I don't need that much oil up there. But the adverse effect of it is, is you're hurting your roller lifters. The roller lifters are not getting the proper amount of volume, of pressure, volume. So what they do is they make the hole smaller, restricts the oils to the rockers, the lifters get full pressure, full volume, and the push rods just dribble out instead of flying out. Plenty of lubricant for the top. Make it too small, you don't get enough lubricant on the top. So that's we're not going to talk about that too much more because you can make a complete segment out of a valve train. A complete segment. I could go into that cylinder head right there and bring out some different rockers and show you what you're trying to accomplish and where you want to hit it on the tip, where you want it to be hitting on the tip when the valve is all the way open. There's, there's way more to it than, oh, that's a right light push rod. Nope, not necessarily. You have to move the towers up or down to get the rocker geometrics correct. I will spend eight hours on a set of cylinder heads shimming it to the correct height when you first assemble an engine. But like I said, that's a whole, a whole other segment. Then, when it comes to the turbo motors, very, very important. John's bought some beautiful covers. Look at those things. Uh, they're very heavy. They, they are not tinny light things. Uh, neither is that oil pan, because with a turbo, you get a certain amount of pressure. So, in that, in that case is, what do I do? Well, a lot of people run vacuum pumps. You can't run a vacuum pump on any car with a turbo. No matter how good the ring packs are, no matter how nice the cylinders are, no matter what the situation is, there's blow-by into the crankcase. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. Most cases, they have one. And a lot of buddies you see that run turbo, my God, I got oil running down the sides of my valve covers. Why? Because you're not getting rid of your pressure. John's case is, we're putting two. Two of them, not one, two. They run off the individual cans with breathers on them, and they breathe gently. So no matter how much boost he puts to it, it will keep the pressure in the motor very, very low. Preferably zero. Oh, let's see, what else can we talk about on that? I think we've uh, uh, pretty much run the gamut on this thing. You, you, you mentioned at one point the motor was stroked. Can you explain what stroking a motor oh, is? Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Uh, there's a thing called board stroke. Everybody says, oh, my motor is board stroke. <coughs> well, what you do is, we'll, we'll talk what everybody knows about. A belly button <coughs> engine, small block Chevrolet. The greatest freaking design motor ever. But uh, you, you take a small block Chevrolet, and I've got a 350, right? And they're going to turn it into a 383. Well, what they do is they bore the cylinders a little bit bigger. That's basically to clean up the bores, and they put what they call a longer stroke. Now, a longer stroke is when you take the center line of the crankshaft to the center line of the rod, what they do is they move this this way. They just make it longer which gives it more stroke, more sweat volume in the cylinder. That's called, that's what, that's what stroking a motor is. Actually moving the center line of, moving the center line of the crank out. That's, that's, that's the stroke. We should have so talked about that. To, we to, to stroke this motor, did we buy a special crankshaft? Yes, or? we bought a 4340 billet crank for this engine. That's what okay, we did. Okay, well that's a, that's a forged crank, but the, 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 the design of the crankshaft that's different than a stock crankshaft then, right? By far. Okay. The metal, the metal, what it is made out of is far, far better material. Far better material. No, but to get a stroked uh, motor, did the machine shop make any modifications to the crankshaft? Or no, we ordered it with certain specs? You have to be made that way. Okay. Now, there are people that have done before and taken small block Chevrolets, and they run Honda Civic connecting rods in it. They're trying to spin 10, 12,000 RPMs. Short term. Short lived, but it makes a lot of power. What they'll do is they'll take this crankshaft, this one here happens to be for a big block Chevrolet, is they will take this journal and make it a lot smaller. Now, when they make the journal a lot smaller, what they'll do is they'll grind all off the back side and leave it on, leave some on the front side. So now what they just did was they, they took a stock stroke 
and by making the journal smaller, they just took off this part of the circle, the back side of the circle. Now the stroke is longer. So you can take a stock crank and you can play with it. Will it live? No. Will it make power? Yes. How long? That's a guess is all you can do on that one. I don't recommend that. Uh, sky's the limit on what you want to spend on parts. I buy a lot of billet cranks, which are very expensive. I mean, you can spend five, six thousand dollars on a crank. Um, same with the connection rods. We don't use stock rods. Like I said, this, this has got 43, 40 rods in it. They make better ones? Yes, they make billet rods. If you go into a billet rod versus a, a 4340, um, this is a this is a billet rod. This particular rod is twenty-two hundred dollars. This rod here is eight hundred. You get what you pay for it. There's different designs. There's H beams. There's I beams. There's all kinds of things. These are two obviously two different styles. Just because you spend a lot of money, it also doesn't make it good. I'm gonna give you a perfect for instance. Here's a motor right here, brand spanking new billet rod, 60 passes on it. It failed. Eleven thousand dollars worth of parts gone in <laughs> two and a half seconds. It's just a it's just a part failure. That is a billet rod. So it doesn't matter what kind of money you spend. It stuff happens. It happens. I think we basically covered all the bases on this up to this point, John. Right? Okay. All right. Thank you very much for the for the review on the motor and everybody out there. Uh, thank you for watching.